O God, come to my assistance. O Lord, make haste to help me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us acknowledge our sins and seek the Lord's pardon and peace. I confess to Almighty God and, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask the Blessed Mary of a Virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. O God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us a memorial of your passion, grant us, we pray, so to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of our, your redemption, who live and reign with God the Father in unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said to the people, Remember how for forty years now the Lord your God has directed all your journeying in the desert, so as to test you by affliction and find out whether or not it was your intention to keep his commandments. He therefore let you be afflicted with hunger, and then fed you with manna, a food unknown to you and your fathers, in order to show you that not by bread alone does one live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of the Lord. Do not forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery, who guided you through the vast and terrible desert with its seraph serpents and scorpions, its parched and waterless ground, who brought forth water for you from the flinty rock and fed you in the desert with manna, a food unknown to your fathers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise 
first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because the loaf of bread is one, we, though many, are one body, but we all partake of the one loaf. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. that came down from heaven, says the Lord. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to the Jewish crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life. I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us, I am the living bread come down from heaven, and whoever eats this bread, whoever eats me, will live forever. This bread is my flesh, and it is given for the life of the world. Then when the Jews don't quite get it, which I understand, there's a real turn here from love your neighbor to eat my flesh. Jesus doubles down and says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you do not have life within you. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The one who feeds on me 
will have life because of me. But many Jews go away confused and disheartened. Many from that time on no longer followed Jesus. Why would Jesus say such things? Scripture tells us that he knew his disciples would not believe him. So he said these things knowing that people would believe because he said them. So why did he do it? Does Christ not desire everyone to be saved? Why would he take such a firm stance on this? Why was he not more patient with the Jews, the very people he had come specifically to save? Because this, brothers and sisters, Christ's real presence in the Eucharist is fundamental to our faith, our belief in Jesus Christ. The beginning of John's Gospel says, Christ came to his people, and his own people did not accept him, but to those who did accept him, he gave the power to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Everyone's favorite verse to quote, John 3.16, reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. John is being repetitive so that we can see the pattern. Belief in Christ means having life, and not just life in this world, but life with God, life eternal. And then in John's Gospel today, we hear Jesus connecting something else to having life. Again, he says, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you do not have life within you. So John, through his repetition of Christ bringing us life, strongly correlates belief in Christ with having eternal life, but also correlates both of those with consuming the flesh and blood of Jesus. If we are to have life, we must believe in Christ. And according to Christ himself, we must become united intimately with him by consuming him who tells us that he is the bread of life, who tells us his body and his blood are true food and true drink. Now, I began writing this homily trying to convince y'all that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist, but I realized something very quickly as I was praying with the readings. It would be fruitless. I could talk about the reality of Christ in the Eucharist until my face turned blue, I could expound on how Christ is in the Eucharist through transubstantiation. I could list hundreds of examples of Eucharistic miracles throughout church history. I could rant and rave about the impact of Eucharistic adoration on the faithful and on the lives of the saints. But why should I bother with any of that? Christ is clear. He tells us, I am the bread of life. He who eats this bread has eternal life. If we cannot trust God when he tells us something and repeats it multiple times with increasing intensity, why would anyone listen to me? It's not like I'm going to convince anyone that way. There were centuries of Christians who believed in the real presence of the Eucharist before the church ever thought of transubstantiation or had a multitude of Eucharistic miracles to pull out and present. I can help y'all understand what the Eucharist is, but that doesn't help y'all to believe in the real presence. And this is what Jesus was confronting. But Father, I hear you say, the Jews were hearing this all for the first time. How could they possibly just accept what this holy man from Bethlehem was telling them, especially when he was telling them to eat his flesh? But this is a false assumption. God had been preparing Jews for 1,500 years just for this, for the Messiah to come. Just as John repeats that belief in Christ means eternal life, God has repeated throughout the centuries that if we are to have life, we need to feast on the nourishment that he provides for us, which is his word. Miraculously, the Jews escaped Egypt by the hand of God, he kept them safe from harm and brought them to the land that he had promised them. When they got there, they scouted out the land, 
but didn't trust that God was true to his word. And so they didn't go in to get the Jews to trust him at his word. They spent 40 years in the desert relying on him for everything. Their food was manna from heaven, bread of the angels. To drink, Moses struck a rock and water flowed from its side. Thus he sustained them so that after their journey in the desert was over, after their trial was complete, they returned to their promised land, trusting in God and entered into it. Moses told the people, for 40 years you've journeyed in the desert so God could test you to see if you actually intended to keep his commandments, his word. They started this great trial of 40 years in the desert as slaves, a nomadic people who had no place to call home. And they came out on the other side, victors, a powerful nation possessing a land of milk and honey, and all because they learned to trust God when he told them things. So in our gospel, Jesus isn't talking to an ignorant people. He's talking to a people who have in their history to great success learned that they need to trust the word of God, who relive Exodus and their journey in the desert every year, similar to how we go through Lent every year. But Moses told the people back then, just as he reminds us today, man does not live on bread alone, but on the word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And what is the first line of the Gospel of John? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus Christ is the word, and man cannot live on bread alone. We live on the word that comes from God, and that word is Jesus. The Eucharist is not just bread alone. It is the word of God. It is Jesus. The Eucharist sustains us through the trials of this life. The Eucharist is the bread from heaven that God provides for us to strengthen us. Just as water flowed from the side of the rock in the desert to quench their thirst, so too did blood and water flow from the side of Christ. So too does wine and water, which become the blood of Christ, flow into the chalice on that same side of the altar. God gets it. Life is tough. This world, this life can feel like a barren spiritual wasteland. But if we come to trust in God, if we allow ourselves to be fed by God, who offers us this holy bread of eternal life and this chalice of everlasting salvation, if we realize that this world cannot save itself or anyone, and that we need divine intervention, if we believe that God is good, and good to his word, then we can believe, even though our senses deceive us to the reality, that this Eucharist which we humbly come forward to receive is Jesus, really and truly, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And it strengthens us so we can journey with God toward our promised land of heaven. You will bring forth bread from the earth. Alleluia, alleluia. You will bring forth bread from the earth. Alleluia, alleluia. And wine which gives warmth to men's hearts. Alleluia, alleluia. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. You will bring forth bread from the earth. Alleluia, alleluia. Brethren, let us pray to Jesus Christ, the bread of life, as we joyfully say. Happy are those who are called to your heavenly banquet. Priests of the new and eternal covenant, you offered perfect sacrifice to the Father on the altar of the cross. Teach us to offer ourselves with you. Happy are those who are called to your heavenly banquet. King of justice and peace, you consecrated bread and wine as the sign of your offering. Unite us as victims with you. Happy are those who are called to your heavenly banquet. True worshiper of the Father, your perfect offering is celebrated by the church from the rising to its, the setting of the sun. Unite in your body those who partake of the one bread. 
Happy are those who are called to your heavenly banquet. Manna from heaven, you nourish the church with your holy body and blood. Grant that we may walk strengthened by this food. Happy are those who are called to your heavenly banquet. Unseen host of our banquet, you stand at the door and knock. Come to us, stay and share the evening meal with us. Happy are those who are called to your heavenly banquet. In your mercy, continue to sanctify all who are afflicted from the present pandemic and draw us all closer to you and to one another in this time of suffering. Happy are those who are called to your heavenly banquet. Let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You have given us bread from heaven, containing in itself all the light. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you, my Lord and my God. Amen. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.